hi Kathy, all the way in um, uh, London. So, um, also on on sort of this um, controversial, continuing with this controversial debates. Um, uh, I'm gonna. I'm very pleased to introduce you, Professor Kathy Castell, um, who does a lot of research that aims to uncover the nature of mental representation and, com and computation that underlines aspects of language and learn literacy and learning. She has a very strong interest in translating this research to improve policy, policies and practice in education. And recently uh, won the ESRC uh, Celebrating Impact Prize for Outstanding International Impact. Um, Kathy is uh, editor of uh, various of, editor in chief of various of international uh, journals. Um, and currently she's the president of the Experimental Psychology Society uh, and serving as a panel member of the REP, so their version of the National, uh, um, national Reading Panel. Uh, and she also is leading a major review into the future of uh, the PhD in social sciences for the ERCC and the list goes on. But um, on that, Kathy, um, just say hi so that we can just double check. We just had load shedding in South Africa. So we needed to- yeah, Really nice to be here. <laughs> All right, so on that note, Kathy, over to you. You've got about 30 minutes and then we will take uh, 10 minutes of any questions, any comments. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. And it's a, it's a huge pleasure um, and honor to, to be here. I've spent a little bit of time over the last few months talking with uh, Nangamso and Nick and Professor Pretorius um, about how the theory of reading uh, may apply in the South African context. Um, and I think it's a really interesting problem. Um, so I am talking to you from, from London. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the South African context, um, but I hope to address some of the, the issues that came up in the previous talk um, about African languages and, and the extent to which existing research can inform um, your progress in South Africa. So I want to share my screen, hopefully that's going to work. Um, let's see if I can. Right, is that, um, is that showing my slides? Hopefully it is, hopefully somebody will tell me if that's not showing my slides, because I can no longer. Yes, yes, we can, we can see it, thanks. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much. Okay, so, um, the way I always like to start, and this should be a, an easy message for an audience like this, is just to remind ourselves that literacy is really the foundation of so much. It's the most important milestone of a child's education, learning to read. Um, it's the foundation of knowledge, of work, social interaction. Uh, it's a major, low literacy is a major contributor to poverty and inequality. And I've got a quote there on the bottom. This is a, a quote from a federal judge in the United States. And it's in relation to a court case brought by pupils in the state of Michigan who sued the government because they alleged that the conditions in their schools had become so bad that illiteracy was the norm. And what the judge, the panel of federal judges decided was that actually the opportunity to acquire literacy should be considered as a fundamental right, guaranteed by the US constitution. And that's no small thing. Uh, and their reasoning was that literacy actually provides the foundation for democracy itself, for political participation. And Judge Clay said, every meaningful interaction between a citizen and the state is predicated on a minimum level of literacy, meaning that access to literacy is necessary to access our political process, voting, taxes, the legal system, jury duty. There's so much at stake here. Um, and so I think it's, it's great that um, there's, there's a, a focus on this in South Africa. And I must say that when I, when I read uh, the words uh, of, of the president thinking about what the aspirations are for reading, I mean, this is just music to a reading scientist's ears. And what I like so much about this is that it reflects such a deep understanding of how important reading is. So there's an understanding that early reading is the foundation that determines a child's progress through school, higher education, and into the workplace. 
There's a recognition that if we don't get reading right, then all other interventions will be wasted. And finally, there's a recognition that actually, if we're to meet these sorts of goals, then it will need to mobilize the whole nation. It's an, it's an enormous undertaking and to, to meet this goal. So I want to talk about what cognitive science has to offer to that. Um, and as a reading scientist, how I see um, uh, the shape of things in South Africa. And my first point is to, to think about what the present situation is. And the fact is that we don't know the present situation. And we don't know the present situation because there's not a system of routine, formal assessments within primary school. So the best data that, that I could find of, of that's a good picture of the whole of South Africa is the PEARLS data, which was a number of years ago now. And as we've heard in the last talk, the PEARLS data um, you know, showed, showed real concern about literacy in South Africa. And you can see there a graph showing that 78% of children at grade four were reading below benchmark. And that means that they can't read for meaning. This is a very low benchmark. And you can see the international comparison there is at 4%. Um, and the, the graph on the right simply shows the, the different countries that participate in this assessment. And you can see South Africa there at the bottom below Morocco and Egypt. And the overall situation is likely to be worse um, given COVID closures. But again, we don't know how much worse um, you know, or, or what the state of affairs is. So I think my first point is that how will you monitor your national progress toward the 2030 goals without an assessment framework in place? Now, when I started talking um, with Funda Wanda about these issues, I remember saying at one, at one point that 78% is a very big number. And to a reading scientist, this is a very big number because reading is a phenomenon that's well understood. Um, we have over a hundred years of research on reading and reading acquisition. The book here I've got on the left is a, you know, one of the initial texts on this from 1908. And many of the insights in that book hold today. Um, it's one of the most well-studied problems in the whole of the psychological and brain sciences. And there's a very strong consensus, really as strong as it gets in science, about the basic underpinning mechanisms um, of how we learn to read, and how that scientific understanding should be translated to instruction. So as a reading scientist, I look at these figures and I think, why should it be this way in a country where there's a schooling system and which kids routinely go to school? And I think one of the things I've been thinking about over the last few years is a phenomenon known as the reading wars. And I'll, I'll show you a paper that I wrote about this um, at the end of the talk. But this basically reflects the fact that for some reason, over the last hundred years, reading has become politicized. It's become you know, part of a, a culture war phenomenon. Um, and it's a hundred years of raging debate about how to teach children to read. And the basic uh, dividing line between that is, is around whether reading should be taught um, as an analytic problem so by analytic, I mean you're breaking down um, the words into their component parts, or whether uh, reading is, is more about the learning of whole words and their meanings. And I'll try to show you why the latter doesn't make sense in the context of an alphabetic language. But I think the reading wars really kicked off. It wasn't really a, a debate about reading. It was more a, a general touchstone for polarization um, across general pedagogical and political philosophies about the role of the teacher and the role of the child um, in the learning environment. And sometimes um, this debate has been cast as an attack on teacher knowledge and autonomy. Um, but my position is that it's really time to abandon the reading wars and treat reading as the scientific problem that it is and look at how our insights about that scientific problem can be translated in various contexts to inform instruction. And I think one of the things that you need to, the first thing you need to understand about reading is that reading is not a natural process. We are not born to read. We do not have neural hardware. We're not born with that hardware that would, that would enable us to read. Evolutionarily, reading is a recent phenomenon. I um, mean, we're not, we're not designed to do that. And so in order to learn to read, the brain has to recycle uh, neurons built for other functions 
over a very long period of time. And that takes instruction, dedication, and practice. So it's not like learning to walk or talk. And I like to give the example of music. Music is another area in which children, some children, learn how to map visual symbols onto sounds, movements, et cetera. And nobody in their right mind would think that a child would just pick up how to, how to read music naturally by listening to music. So what I want to do is take you on a little tour of what needs to happen in, in order to read for meaning by grade four. And I want to just start with a simple example. So we've got a sentence here, Jess decided to cut and run. She couldn't face what might happen next. Very easy for us, but it, it immediately exposes the complexity of the reading process. So we've got, we've got to understand what these lines, squiggles, and dots are. And actually, even though we can read that, that's a highly confusable matrix, right? Distinguishing rub from run or distinguishing run from something like earn, right? Where the letters are mixed up in different positions. We've got morphemes, right? So we've got ED. All of a sudden, this isn't just about sounds, it's about meaning. So ED in decided, it reflects the past. We need to understand the meanings of these words. There's ambiguous and figurative language here. What do you mean she couldn't face what happened next? You mean my face? What, what's meant by face there? There's causal connections. We need to use our background knowledge and our inferencing skills. What's happened that Jess needs to cut and run? And of course, there's demands on working memory and executive skills. So skilled reading, as we know it, is a multifaceted problem. But it's a mistake to think that instruction can, can account for all of these aspects at the same time. In the same way, as if you're training a child to play the piano, you don't start off with a Tchaikovsky piece. You know, you start off with very simple notes and a simple scale. So there's an order in which we need to build up in order to allow children um, to do all of the things that, that, that are required in skilled reading. And I think it's also a mistake. We must not model instruction in our own introspective experience because we've already been through that 10 year process that it takes to learn to read. Right? So we need to step outside ourselves um, and, and approach it from a child first learning to read. So first point, reading, and we've heard this in the last talk, reading starts with oral language. Right? So children come into the classroom with a spoken language, and we are born to use spoken language. It's uh, something that we're innately disposed to do. We have vocabulary, a grammar. We've got some later narrative skills. These all predict later reading comprehension. And we know that early interventions in oral language also impact on later comprehensions. Interestingly, over the last few years, we've gotten a lot more um, understanding of the oral language abilities that children come into the classroom with and we know that there's a huge degree of variability. There's variability across age, for example, um, the month in which you were born and how that relates to school entry, um, socioeconomic status plays in. Um, so there's enormous variation. And at least in England, we think that about two children in every 30, a classroom of 30, will have some problems with language at school entry. They'll need extra intervention. Of course, in South Africa, there's additional challenges because it's a multilingual context. There are language of instruction considerations. And as recognized in the previous talk, there's a, not very much research on this. Right? So we need to have more research in this area. Now I've looked at the curriculum and I think that you know, it does provide a provision for rich language experiences in the foundation phase. Um, there are language routines, there's shared reading. But one thing I picked up on is that there's no baseline assessment of a child's language ability at school entry. And with the class sizes in South Africa, that's pinning a lot on an individual teacher to try to assess all these children, keep that in mind, keep their individual needs in mind, and some are bound to be lost. So even the most skilled teacher could not do that um, in a classroom of the sizes that we're talking about. So that's one thing to consider is whether there needs to be a formal assessment of baseline language ability at school entry. Now, we heard about shared book reading in the last talk. Shared book reading is very important uh, means to build oral language skill. But I think that there's been confusion that that's also a means to learn to read. 
And the research shows us that it is not. So this is a, a neat study looking at what was happening with the children's eye movements when they were being read to during storybook reading. And I think the idea that people have had is that you know, if you read to a child, if they're looking at the text, they'll sort of pick up how to interpret those lines, squiggles, and dots. But if we can look at the, the pictures here, you see these circles on the, the page. This is a, a visualization of what children's eyes are doing when they're being read to. So these are children just in the first year of reading instruction. And you can see that their eyes hardly even go on the printed text. That printed text is uninterpretable to those children without instruction. Um, and it's boring for them, right? They, they, it's meaningless. So they don't look at it. Right, so what these authors and many, many other studies have concluded is that although shared reading is very important to build language, and there's all sorts of reasons that shared reading is a nice thing to do, it is not a major vehicle for the development of print skills without uh, other forms of systematic instruction. So in order to, to begin to learn to read, we've got to have a means of attaching spellings, which I've said are just arbitrary lines, squiggles, and dots, onto oral language. And there's two choices for how we do that. One is to try to map spellings onto meanings directly. And yeah, this seems to make sense because after all, we read for meaning, right? So why shouldn't we just learn the meanings of individual words? The problem with this is that that mapping between spellings and meanings is highly arbitrary. And what I mean by that is that if we take three words like hen, pen, and 10, those look the same, but they don't mean similar things, right? So there's no relationship between the way a word looks and its meaning, except for in very specific isolated cases. And humans are very bad at this type of learning. So there's really an upper limit as to how many words we could learn like this. And Chinese is a good example. So in Chinese, there's a lot of rote learning of characters. But the, the difference with Chinese is that it's thought that learning about 4,000 characters is sufficient for full literacy. And that takes a very long time. It takes years and years and years to do that. But in a language like English or French or, or Dutch or, or et cetera, there are many, many more words. So in English, we need to learn about 70,000 words by the time we're 20 to reach full literacy. And in an analysis that I did of reading curricula um, in English in the first year of reading instruction, children are exposed to about 5,000 words. So that is far greater than is possible for children to learn to read by rote. So that gives us another option, and that is to learn the relationship between spellings and sounds. Now, writing systems like English and in African languages as well, these are just technologies for expressing language, expressing language in vision. And in English and in African writing systems, these are primarily alphabetic. So what that means is that the symbols relate to sounds. And so what phonics is, it's just, it's just instruction on how the writing system works. So it's just telling children in advance, this is what these letters are and this is what they do. And so in a language like English, what you'd be telling them is that that letter H is H, right? And E is E, so H, E, N, hen. And this is an enormously efficient way to learn to read because you can have you know, a relatively small number of rules mapping these spellings onto sounds. And then that gives you access to that oral language system that we've been born to have, right? So I can decode pen, 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 and I know what a pen is. So all of a sudden I have a mechanism to give me a hook into oral language and to read for meaning. And research shows that while some children can discover this mapping on their own, virtually all children require explicit instruction. And certainly explicit instruction is a far more efficient and effective way in order for children to learn that mapping. And so for you, you may say, oh, well, you know, I, I just look at the word and I learn the meaning. Nobody becomes a skilled reader without knowing that mapping. And it's a teacher's job to teach a child that mapping. If we decide that the child should just learn it on their own, well, that's just devolving the job to the child, right? So this is an essential part of learning to read, is learning that mapping between spelling and sound. 
Now, looking at the CAPS curriculum, although there is some phonics in there, it's unlikely to be adequate for almost all learners. Um, and the reasons are as follows. The first thing is that the curriculum phases in phonics, in my opinion, in a, it's way too slow. So there's been a choice not to have any phonics, not to have any reading instruction in the first year. And so that immediately says, oh my gosh, you're gonna have to do a lot then in the second year of reading instruction. But what happens in CAPS is still by the end of the third year, these spelling sound correspondences, they're still being introduced. And the problem is that if children don't have that phonics knowledge, they will not be able to read for meaning. And so a lot of the instructional time that's spent in CAPS on guided reading and writing is not as effective as it could be or that it needs to be because children literally do not have the skills in order to, to get that practice. And research shows, in fact, that a faster pace with phonics instruction tends to yield superior outcomes, probably because it provides children the tools to begin to read independently. And a mounting number of studies now are showing that ability to read well determines whether a child reads often. And the, the other thing we know and I'll get to is that reading often for pleasure is vital in becoming a skilled reader. So the phonics curriculum in CAPS is just too slow and, and it doesn't actually align with the rest of the curriculum. For example, in writing, children are being asked to, to, to write diaries while they don't even have the tools to map letters to sounds. There are also strategies in CAPS that undermine phonics instruction. So there are, there's material in there about guessing from pictures, guessing from context. And anytime you ask a child to just guess a word from, from the picture, that's actually bringing them away from learning what they need to learn, which is how that writing system works, right? And, and we've heard about um, African languages. African languages are slightly different from, from a language like English or French or German, but they are alphabetic, right? And what we tend to know is that the writing systems are more transparent. There are more correspondences to learn, but it's more systematic. And it does have an agglutinative, these languages tend to have agglutinative morphologies, but that's no different from something like Basque, for example, um, where morphology plays a very big role. So I, I think that it's a matter of degree. I don't think that African languages pose a qualitatively different, qualitatively different um, challenges. The final thing I wanna mention is that actually, phonics is so important, but there's no formal recorded assessment of a child's phonics knowledge. And again, even the most skilled teachers, given the class sizes in South Africa, could not possibly be expected to know a child's individual phonics knowledge and keep track of that um, as they go. So there's really a need for an efficient assessment of where a child is with their phonics knowledge really by the end of, of year one. And I want to show you some data from a journey really that, that England's taken in this respect. So in 2007, it became law here to teach children phonics. Um, and this was um, determined after an expert panel review much like the National Reading Panel in the United States in, in the early uh, part of this uh, millennium um, and what's happening in South Africa now. So in 2007, it became law to teach phonics, um, but there was a feeling that actually progress was still not as good as it needed to be. And so in 2012, the government brought in a very simple assessment given to children at the end of grade one, which is when children are um, five or six. And all that, that's asked of children is to read aloud 20 words and 20 non-words. And non-words are things like vib or shorg. And people say, why do you read non-words? These don't have meaning. But the reason we read these is to tell whether children have the skills to decode unfamiliar words. Because to a child, almost every word that they read is unfamiliar at some point. So they need to have those tools to be able to read them. And non-words tell us that. And the really interesting thing about this assessment is that in its first year, five years after schools were required to teach phonics, only 58% of children met the minimum expectation. So how could that be? And it turned out that, you know, schools, they just needed to improve their, their instruction, right? And what we saw over the subsequent three years were dramatic improvements in um, children's performance on this very basic screening test. And evaluation of the phonics screen showed 
that schools use these results in order to refine their own practice and to improve teacher knowledge. And so what you can see, there's actually two bars for each year on there, and that's because children who don't pass in the first year then have to have an intervention and they take it again in the second year. So we're now at a stage where 92% of children by the end of year two have a, a, the foundations to become a good reader. And that's the foundations. It's not, that's not the whole thing, but it's the first part. Looking more broadly, we now know that phonics screen performance in England is the primary determinant of reading comprehension on the Pearls test. So it's, it's, a, it's a bigger, more important factor than age, um, SES, gender, school context. Right, so how a child does in this initial assessment of their phonics knowledge is driving wider improvements um, in reading comprehension. Okay, so that's, that's um, the England phonics screen. I want to now move on beyond phonics because, um, you know, of course, phonics is just the start. Um, reading is much broader than phonics. Phonics is the foundation. Ultimately, children need to build fluency, right? We can't be having children sounding out words it's very attention demanding, it's very slow. And in order to read for meaning and to read text, we need to be able to recognize words quickly, automatically, as you do. And so what that means ultimately is we'll have to develop a skill whereby we can look at a word and immediately recall its meaning. And we actually know that this is a special- okay. You've got just under five minutes. Okay, this is a special um, brain pathway um, that's, that's built. Um, and the way that we do that is through practice, right? So children, they need to practice um, reading independently, reading for pleasure to build that meaning skill. And I think that the opportunity to build fluency is really limited in CAPS because of the poor phonics provision and the lack of assessment. Going on to text comprehension, text comprehension is hard. Right? So I'm just giving you here a passage from a book it's very popular. It's one of the first chapter books that children in England read. Um, it's, it's mainly for children between the ages of, of seven and nine. And what you can see here, it's not like spoken language. Children don't talk like this, right? He nodded politely and climbed onto the scooter. He was a bit wobbly, but zooming around by nobody's business, right? They're big words, they're big sentences. Fluent recognition, word recognition is necessary in order to be able to do this. It's harder than spoken language, right? So we need our spoken language, but we also need those fluent word recognition abilities to, to even be able to get to grips with text comprehension. So just to sum up the ingredients of reading for meaning, oral language, we begin with oral language, it's very important. Phonics instruction, this is just instruction on how the writing system works, it's hard. Um, text experience to build fluency, reading for pleasure. And actually this is a tractable problem, no matter what the context, no matter what the language. And I want to just sum up by saying that, you know, if, if South Africa is to meet these 2030 goals, there's a few things, um, and it was interesting to see the recommendations of the National Reading Panel because they align with my own. My first is that it's important to banish ideology. Reading is a scientific problem, right? And we have a very, very good evidence base about how the brain learns to read. Equip teachers in the practice of the science, to practice the science of reading. So looking at teacher training colleges and continuing professional development. Align your curriculum with the science of reading. And critically, track progress through the foundation phase to see how you're doing in meeting those goals. And one concept I really like is the concept of limited instructional time. There's lots of things that are very nice to do um, for children when they're learning to read, but some of them are much more effective than others. And if you want to improve um, the, the, the state of affairs by 2030, you don't have any time to waste. So you need to use methods that are proven and that are effective. And to read more um, about this, um, you can read a paper that I wrote called Ending the Reading Wars. It's an open access paper, so it's, it's free. Um, there's a link there, or you can just search for my name um, and the words Reading Wars. Um, and I'm always happy to take questions um, by email um, and talk further. Thanks very much. He's on. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Um,
sorry that we had to rush you uh, there towards the end, um, but we do want to sort of move along on uh, onto our program. Um, and I think we probably uh, have only three minutes to take questions um, for Kathy or comments, um, at least from what I have listened to that there are some similarities or agreements between our two speakers today. Um, and I, the question that I keep constantly uh, reminding or asking myself and most recently of what had just happened in the UK, I don't know if you've been following uh, literacy there, just uh, uh, a week ago, right? Uh, Kathy, all of the, the debates again uh, have sort of come up and um, many back and forth amongst researchers and academics around these reading walls. So although there's seemingly like there's a lot of research that's been done, um, these, are, these sort of small differences, um, we cannot able to sort of find a way moving forward, and particularly if we collectively are trying to reach the 2030 goal. So any comments before we start with the panel? And let's help you, oh, no, I'll give you mic. So Kathy, you'll just have to listen through uh, your speak on your side. Hi, Kathy, thank you. Penny Groom from Class Act and the NECT. Um, <clears throat> We very much follow the science of reading approach, so it was great to hear everything that you had to say. Just considering that African languages are um, have transparent orthographies, um, so I'm not talking about the agglutinative issues, but just the transparent orthography, surely that should be even faster, a faster phonics program. And just looking at the way that our phonics programs are structured, Many of the phonemes included in an African language phonics program are actually consonant blends. Um, so the, the individual consonant doesn't you know, change the sound, it's just a blend, um, as opposed to you know, a, a, a diphthong or a, a digraph. So should those, if you consider cognitive load and if you consider the, the need to have um, reading instructions speeded up, should all of those uh, consonant blends be included as a, phonic pro a phonics program, or should they be taught as a blending strategy? Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, I, I, I don't wanna to say too much about African languages and these con consonant blends because I'm not sure of exactly, exactly what, what the question is. I think you've, you've mentioned that, that African languages are written in a more transparent way. And that's certainly the case because the writing systems are, I mean, English is a very old writing system. It, it's, it's completely crazy. Nobody would ever transcribe English in the way that it's transcribed. So it's very difficult to learn. Um, you know, languages that are more transparent, um, it, you know, if we go to something like Italian is much more transparent, Serbian, um, th these, these are, these are easier to learn because it's more systematic. And that's also the case in the African languages. So indeed, it should be even faster to learn that, than something like English. So the fact that it's stretched over such a long period is very curious um, in CAPS. And you're right to mention cognitive load because although there are more uh, correspondences, the systematicity is greater. So it should be faster. Um, having said that, um, you shouldn't get carried away. Nobody should get carried away by thinking that children should just be able to discover this on their own. Writing is not an intuitive code. Speech is continuous, whereas writing is discrete. And so that's not something that comes naturally to a child. Um, I think I, I didn't really catch uh, about these consonant blends, but it, in, I think the general thrust is the idea that if there's a way that writing maps onto sounds that you can describe right, then it's worthwhile telling that to a child, right? It's, it's worthwhile conveying that knowledge so that a child doesn't have to, to try to, to do that themselves and possibly go on false trails, which we know that they do if you leave it up to children to, to discover how their writing systems work. So I, I hope that that sort of answers your question, but please get in touch with me, Penny, because I'd like to hear more about these, um, the writing systems. Cool. So. Um... Okay, uh, I think that was the last. I didn't see any other hand or comments. Okay, Miss Eleanor.
education and the reading wars, we discuss phonics, but there's no intra-language conversations in African languages. And I think until we reach that stage where we can invest in scientists to this level, who have researched reading to this level in their own languages and discuss it in a linguistic community, it's going to be very difficult to make progress. And it's also going to be very difficult to provide uh, academic, true academic inclusion. Very good point. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that seems like um, a, a point that's more political that's outside my remit. But I think what I would say is that I totally agree that um, the, this research on, on reading and other aspects of cognition has been very, um, you know, it's, it's been concentrated in, in European languages and orthographies. And I think um, understanding about African writing systems is utterly fascinating. And I think, you know, Lily Pretorius has done some wonderful work describing this. So I think um, trying to, to convey that knowledge and to share the knowledge um, and to get it out there and to understand how that relates to instruction is, is absolutely vital. Um, and and, and to, to get teachers involved in, in, in doing that. Um, and I, I, that's one of the reasons why I've started myself talking to people like um, Ngamso.